Tim, I want to start the show with the craziest stat I have ever seen about Formula One. Are you ready? Oh, my God. Let's do it. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little so, nervous. So there have been 1,119 Formula One races in history. Okay? So we're not even at the 1,200 mark yet. Fernando Alonso will likely hit, unless we don't hear anything, 400 mm-hmm. races this year. So Fernando Alonso has taken part in one-third or more than one-third of every Formula One race ever, like at, at, at the entire in the entirety. Like if you were to watch, like just put a, all the Formula One uh, races on shuffle, you'd have a one-in-three shot that Alonso's in that race. Oh, my God. Isn't that nuts? That's wild, man. I never thought about that at all, but that's, in, that's incredible. I would love to put that stat to him. And see what he said. He well, probably then, wouldn't I, be too happy about it because he wouldn't know how old he is. Well, I, I also think part of it, too, is obviously the schedule's increased, right? These It used to be 12, 15 races or whatever it is, and now it's 24. Yeah. So you can yeah. gain very quickly in that. Uh, and he can, yeah. he kind of bridged those eras. Anyway, I just thought that was nuts. And a tribute to our guy, Fernando Alonso, who we love. Oh, man, that's a massive, that's a massive stat. That's a massive uh, accomplishment. Just yeah. like, yeah. I, I mean, I, I could never imagine like being, uh, you know, in one sport, like for so long, you know, as an, as an athlete, if you think about it, like just, just wild, like how, I mean, what about like the NBA and the NFL and all that? Like, I, I don't even know if some of those athletes even get to those kind of numbers, you know? No, I mean, no, obviously no. with the NBA, they probably do. Cause there's what? 82 games in a season. So, yeah, but yeah, even still, so, man, it's, that's it's, it's it's crazy to think that that guy and and you know obviously when he end of, inevitably does retire in the next few years here, um, that number will go back down again. But I don't know if we'll ever have a driver hit 400 races again. I just don't know. Oh, I, don't, I don't know where that's, Lewis that's is a, at. But yeah, it, that's still just a huge. I mean, I'm trying to remember. Oh gosh, like his first drive in the minority. In mm-hmm. Australia, like I didn't think he was gonna see that, you know, that season out. Even like, I mean, it's been an incredible career for him if you think about it. Because you go from doing F one, F one, F one, and then you leave F one. Yeah, yeah. And he it, left it's like you know, he leaves, does you know, wins twenty four hours of Le Mans, um, tries to get the tries tries to win the Indy, Indy five hundred, tries to win Dakar. And then all of a sudden he's able to find his way back into Formula One, which is incredible to say the least. I mean, just trying to find your way to get back into Formula One after you've been gone for like whatever it was, two years or whatever. Like, it, it, yeah. I mean, it's incredible. That's yeah. incredible. And so that number could be higher, Tim. That's the crazy part, too. Like, that could yeah, be for sure. It could 50, you know, 45, 50 races higher than it is, which is, is nuts. Lewis Hamilton, by the way, 350 race starts. Uh, okay. So that's the next closest right now. Uh, okay. And that, again, these are numbers like, are we going to see another driver? And and Max, if he wants to, I don't think that he does, or at least he doesn't talk like he does. Uh, I don't think Max is going to be here when he's 40. I think we enjoy Max now while we got him because I think, you know, he's been doing this a long time and it's been a very tough road. His dad did not make things easy. You know, he's, he's you know, um, he's now a world champion, which is definitely not easy. And uh, he's I, he's talking like, Ah, I don't need this. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, so if you're if he's 31, 32 years old and he leaves, would would anybody be surprised? And so, you know, it's it's going to be a while before we see racers like these two again. Mm-hmm. I agree. I mean, I remember he was asked about this a few races ago and he was yeah. basically like, yeah, I, he's like, I'm not going to be here that long. Like, no. I-, <laughs> I mean, the guy makes what, 50, 60 million pounds a year, like. Yeah, if I had that much money, it's it's hard. Listen, what do they say? It's it's hard to get out of bed early when you have silk pajamas. Like it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> like it's just how do you keep that edge? You know, when you've got you know, I, if I had one million pounds, I'd be like, wow, I'm a rich man. I don't know what I, I don't know how much I'll be working for. Uh, more more competition, I think, Adam. You know, like that. Yes, yeah, got to be what drives you as an athlete. At least in my opinion, that's what you know drove me is competition. Just love being competitive and love competing against people. But yeah, I think um, 
I think like Max's big thing though, Adam, is like when you kind of boil it all down, is just like what are the what are the cars going to be like? What are the cars yeah. going to be like in the next few seasons? Uh, is he going to enjoy the regulation change? Yeah, he's going to enjoy the regular. Is he going to enjoy that? Is like, I uh, I don't know. There's a lot of different things, man, that that could easily I, see Max go. I think. I also get the sense from him, and this is not a um, this is not a bad thing. Uh, I think I get the sense that he really likes doing his online racing and. Uh, there is a lot of scale and a lot of money in that. And a guy like that, if he decided I'm done being in a cockpit and risking my life, I got a good life at home. I've got, you know, he's got his, his girlfriend and his girlfriend's kid, um, who he's a really good stepdad to, and they have a great, great relationship, whatever. If, if he just runs his race team online, um, and you know, does his streams and stuff, it's not like he's going to make 55 million pounds right away, but mm -hmm. I don't think he needs to. I think it's just like, I don't have to leave. I don't have to travel around the world mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to run this race team that's digital. And right now, at least the way the world's going, it seems like it's a pretty good investment. Yeah, for sure. And he gets a ton of enjoyment out of it. I mean, he's got like, uh, you know, that deal, the deal that he has with EA Sports, I mean, is a is a pretty big one as as well. And I think that's worked out quite well for yeah. for himself and also for the video gaming company at the same time. I mean, he's been able to help them with, you know, developing um, the F1 game and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I mean, he's got a lot of stuff off track that would keep him busy. There's no doubt about it. And I think for any athlete, Adam, is is that um, I think when you kind of either lose the passion, drive the edge, and you know it's time to kind of like hang it up with motorsports, it's – it's kind of like you you have to know immediately. It's not something you can kind of like float your way through. It's it'll show up like instantaneously. So if it's um, not something you're really feeling, then like you 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 have to have something. I think to fall back onto. I think to transition out of the mm -hmm. the day to day of of whatever your sport is, because I think that that is very important. It was important for me. I mean, obviously I don't want to be on the sidelines. I want to be still racing. <laughs> yeah, of course. I of mean, course. that's still like ingrained in me. You like I want it, to right? still you be that yeah, racing. Yeah. I still want to be driving race cars, but like, you know, that being said, I mean, you know, you always want to try and find a way of transitioning out of that and finding something that kind of meets, you know, meets whatever the passion is, whatever the drive is, whatever the hunger is well, kind of keep I, you going, you know, I think what we need to do is strike it rich with this podcast and then get you a hundred thousand dollar sim <laughs> uh, that you can just have in your basement. And uh, I don't and think then, my girlfriend then... would uh... <laughs> <laughs> already a video game addiction there, Tim, or uh... <laughs> well, no, I mean, like, Hey, I'm a, I try to be a good boy when it comes to the video games, Adam, like, uh, you know, Carve, I carve out a bit of time, you know, Tim uh, time is what I call it. I carve Tim out a bit of Tim time. <laughs> <laughs> Tim time, I love that. Okay, and then and I say, well, what do you listen, say to Jazz? Like, what do you say? I said, like, Jazz, like, okay, listen, listen, it's, all right, it's like, it's Tim time, all right, babe? Like, you just, you got to go do your thing. It's Tim time right now. And she's like, right. oh, God, you're going to play video games, are you? I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> wow, wow. Amazing, you know what? But I Adam, if I had a sim, oh, jeez, man, I, I know, I'd be, never get out of it. Oh, I would be, uh, I would be divorced or whatever. Like it would just, yeah. There's no <laughs> it would be a good idea. Well, listen, I don't want to encourage divorce, but I do want you to have a sim. Uh, so that's that's the goal here. This podcast needs to be able to buy you a sim one day. Um, <laughs> I would love to have a sim. It'd be yeah, my God. Well, it'd be fun too. You know, Tim, I, I've always thought. And I know we're getting a little off track, and we'll get to the news here in a second. But I think uh, I think racing against Tim Haraney online and 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 having your own sort of uh, closed thing. I think that'd be great for the listeners of the show for sure. I think they would yeah. love to go toe fun. to toe with you. Um, so we have to figure something like that out. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, uh, let's not start with the Daniel Ricardo news, which has dominated headlines. I want to start with something that you reported on months ago. Uh, and you had a pretty passionate opinion about Tim months ago, which is uh, Renault officially saying that their French Formula One operations will cease, meaning they're not going to make a power unit anymore. Uh, the point, by the way, of uh, anybody that makes a PU is that not only do they supply it for their car, but you have the if your power unit's good enough, uh, you can supply it to other teams. And uh, notable teams that used to take a Renault power unit would be Red Bull Racing. Uh, it didn't work out great. Uh, it worked mm -hmm. out great at the beginning. And then mm -hmm. in the mid 2010s, it was not great. Um, and because they have fallen behind the Ferraris 
and the Mercedes power units specifically, uh, Renault just feels like they can't compete in that space. Tim, is is that is that sort of the best way to look at it? Yep, absolutely. I mean, it's it, that's what the way it looks like. It literally just looks like Adam. Hey, we're not good enough, so we're just going to pack it in. Like that right. that's exactly what it looks like. Hey, we can't figure this power unit out that we've been working on for 10 years and we're just going to we're just going to pack that in. Like I mean, when did when did Honda come in? When, when were they in? 2016, I think, I think it was. Like when Honda came McLaren. back in. Yeah, so that And that is, didn't go well. But that's when they returned with the new power unit, right? Cuz right. they left Formula 1 during the, you know, the recession era and all that kind of stuff. And then they came back and they came back when the new power unit was, I want to say it's two years old, but I'm sure people will correct me in the comments if I'm wrong or the compliments section, as Absolutely. Adam likes to call it. Um, so if you take a look at when Honda came in and then when they started to be competitive, they had the rocky road with McLaren and then switching over to Red Bull. And I believe it was 20. It was either 2019 or 2020 and switching over to Red Bull. And then the engine, fin they finally got the power unit um, dialed in. And then it became one of the strongest power units on the grid. Like it, and it was that not, up until now, it's still one of the strongest. It's, it's like Mercedes, Honda, yeah. Ferrari, they're all kind of like super close to each other in terms right. of the power units. And like, where's Renault? Like, where's Alpine? Like, where? Like, how has it, like, I don't understand how that engine power unit is still not competitive. I just don't understand that. One of the storylines of, um, of uh, Drive to Survive in the first season, if you remember, Tim, is obviously Daniel potentially leaving and then ultimately leaving and going to Renault. But uh, secondarily, Red Bull trying to get out of its contract with Renault and trying mm -hmm. to move on or trying to push them to be better. What happened there at that factory that why couldn't they get this done they no had a lot of, they had enough time right? i mean they've had this is what i'm saying right they've had uh, an ample amount of time to kind of get this thing uh right and even when you know the, the power units sort of became sealed adam like there is there's only so much you can kind of do to them now um I think a lot of it has to do with the drive, like driving up costs, right? The more you tinker and work away and find rare earth materials to make different types of components for these engines, the more expensive they start to get. And I think for the teams in Formula One and like during um, COVID, it, it was just kind of like, hey, like we got to find ways of kind of like, you know, let's bring some of these costs down. We don't need to keep doing this to the power units. They're all pretty much equal. What are you going to gain? like half a horsepower, like it doesn't make sense to invest, you know, millions just to find that. So let's just make sure everything is all sealed off. And now there are certain things they can work on with it, um, but you have to have a good excuse for really uh, opening the engine up. Like there, there has to be, uh, I don't know what the, the full description is in the um, FIA ruling book, but essentially there has to be a component in there that's like faulty like it's always failing and there's just there's nothing we can do to fix it so we have to open things up and we have to take a look at what we're doing and we have to figure out how we're going to fix it so we can get a more reliable engine and that's you have to go through the fia for all that kind of stuff and it turns into a whole thing and for renault they've just been down on power for you know so long like a just long so so long and then they build a car that you know, for this season, just doesn't work. It's super heavy. Uh, like they're removing stickers at the start of the season just to save a few grams here and there, just to gain, you know, a thousandth of a second and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I think even starting this season on the back foot, Adam was was detrimental to the entire project as a as a whole. I think leadership has also failed them in this as well. And it's not necessarily leadership within the team. Like there's a lot of really great personnel who work in the team. There's a lot of great personnel who work at the factories, both of them. I think it's more to do with like executive leadership, like people at the top. Like do they, did, did, did they give this their best effort and did they, how did they do it? But by rotating, you know, team personnel, like team principals out, um, CEOs out, removing people, like, consistently and not having a consistent structure, 
I mean, how does that help you, right, Adam? I mean, like I, I don't you're know. you're in I, business. Like, I, just I, t- tell me, how does that well, help? I'll tell you, Tim. I, I think what happens, especially now, is that uh, we've got a bit of a culture in in, in mega corporations like Reno, which is you know the the manufacturer um, that the they'll bring in executives from outside. I don't know what Reno's hiring practices are. But a lot of the time you get you get a bunch of people who are only executive level people and they just cycle through companies in a particular country or a particular uh, continent. Oh, this guy ran such and such at this brand. Uh, here's a completely different company they have no insight on, but they were the VP of marketing or they were the, v- they, the COO or whatever there. So they have C-level, C-suite level experience and let's bring them in and we think things will be good. You look at what I, I'll, I'll give you one and this is nothing to do with racing. Um, the previous Starbucks CEO, and now Starbucks has taken a huge hit on their stock price. The previous Starbucks CEO, I, I'm going to look this up, uh, previous, um, Starbucks CEO, uh, but after Howard Schultz, basically, um, the guy that was running it when, you know, Howard Schultz stepped back, basically turned the company, uh, into a, you know, from a, what they called a third place. So you've got your home, you've got your work, and they and Starbucks wanted their restaurants to be the third place. So you saw, you used to see a lot of people there studying or writing scripts or whatever it was that they were doing because they wanted you to come, they wanted mm-hmm. you to stay, they wanted yeah. you to make it cozy. Yeah. Uh, and so they would get these chairs that were comfortable, like, you know, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, they wanted and you now, to hang out so you can buy yes. more coffee, yeah. Since the pandemic, they moved away from that. Uh, because of the mobile ordering phenomenon, but also they had a CEO or a leadership group in place that believed, ah, you know, the customers are going to buy this coffee anyway. We can jack the prices. We can definitely jack the prices on food. Uh, and, um, and it'll be fine. It'll just be like before, except the people saw the prices and they rejected them. And this is because they came, they brought somebody from outside who didn't really understand the brand. And now they got the guy from Chipotle mm. running uh, Starbucks. Yeah, I saw that. And and I think he'll he at least has quick service restaurant experience. Mm-hmm. But I look at Reno and I when it, to bring it back to them. And I look at it a, a, a company that is a conservative mega car corporation. It's the biggest or second biggest manufacturer of vehicles in the world, okay? And they're trying to take what what makes that successful and implement that DNA into a Formula One team. And you just can't do it. Mm-hmm. I think you, like, that would be like Red Bull Global saying to Red Bull Salzburg, which is a hockey team, uh, hey, we're the way that you run your hockey team, you got to run it the way we run the drinks business. That's not, that doesn't work. Red mm-hmm. Bull has a German, um, uh, a German soccer team, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they run the soccer team separate of the Red Bull brand. Why? Because how you run a drinks company is not how you run a soccer company. And for what I have seen from uh, Alpine Renault as the, the team has formulated over the last five years is a team that is trying to be run by corporate executives who don't know how to run a race team. And it's a very specific set of skills to run a race team, yes. right, Tim? It's, yeah, it's absolutely. So I mean, that's, that's my issue with it. <clears throat> I remember Alain Prost a few years ago because he was a part of Renault when they had like this really weird multi structure of team principles. There was kind of like three of them doing three different things and yeah. Alain Prost was one of them. And I was kind of like, why is Prost not your team? Like, why isn't he just your team? He needs to be your team principal. Like he has to be the top and then everybody else is going to be underneath him because He's been in Formula One his yep. whole life. I mean, he knows what it takes to run a team. And so why isn't he at the top? And I remember reading some quotes uh, from him and, you know, obviously pretty upset with the whole brand as a whole, but basically just saying like how it's too much m- meddling from upper management coming down into the race team. And, you know, we've mm-hmm. seen that before uh, in the past with other teams and it just, it doesn't really work. And then you go out and you get, you know, Flavio Briatore, right? Now you've got, you've got Flavio coming in and you know, you don't really mess with Flavio, man. You, no, you, don't. you don't. And, and it's like now you're seeing all of this different type of restructuring. Uh, you're seeing that he's taken this thing very seriously. 
And also on top of that, Adam, it's it's like you and I had discussed. We discussed this, I want to say, about three or four races ago. I had told you that there's no way that Flavio will let them sell, you know, Alpine. And yep. he's basically came out and said that. And now we're getting reports coming out in him and Oliver Oaks saying, who's the new team principal, saying like, yeah, we're not we're not selling uh, this team just yet. That's what I find interesting is, okay, you've taken away the engine program. Mm -hmm. So what are you now, right? And where is this going? Because if you're not going to sell this team, then what are you going to do? And then now, obviously, we know that it's most likely going to be a deal with Mercedes to get power units to probably get the, the rear end on their car as well on theirs for 2026. And that's fine. But like, what do you become then? Is this just a full out badging exercise? So if it is, then what are you doing to develop your road cars? Yeah. Yeah. Like, which is the whole point, right? Exactly. This is a double, it's a road car and marketing. That's why you were in it. Yeah. And, and they were using like a lot of the technology that they were creating with the 2014 power unit to, you know, uh, basically uh, marry with what they already have for their road car divisions. And then they come up with Alpine, you know, as well as that a lot of the technology that was in is in F1 cars is, is in, is in their little sport coupes. Mm -hmm. And so I am curious to see like what they do moving forward uh, in that department. I mean, obviously they're going to leave the engine facility in France. Um, they're going to leave that pretty much alone. I don't know how many folks are, are going to get laid off or, or, or moved, but it sounds like some of them are going to stay put and work on future technologies for, for Alpine and Renault. Now, what are those future technologies, Adam? Like what? Yeah. You know what I mean? There's just so many questions, man. So yeah, many. Well, and I think, you know, when you look at the way Mercedes – uh, came into the sport um, again because they were in the sport previously a long, long time ago. Um, you look at the way Mercedes came into the sport in twenty in the early 2010s, right? Bought the Braun program. Um, but one of the things that they did, Tim, and you mentioned this, is that, you know, uh, Renault used to have Alain Prost, right? Mm -hmm. Alain Prost is 51 wins. You cannot buy that kind of experience, right? No. Um, outside of a guy like that. And you... And what what does Mercedes do? They bring in Nicky Lauda, and 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 Nicky's not the team principal. Toto's the team principal, but Toto and Nicky are working because Toto's the money guy. Yeah, Toto's the business guy. Yeah, Toto's going to get the sponsorships done, and Nicky is going to tell you here's what's wrong with the car. Mm -hmm. And I look at you know you can look at the um uh you can look at the the history of French Formula One, and they have a ton of drivers. And one guy that sticks out to me, you know, maybe Prost doesn't want to do it anymore. Maybe he's a pain in the ass. I don't know. Uh, or maybe Renault's a pain in the ass and, and pushed him out. But I look at a guy like Jean Alesi, who I grew up watching, who probably should have won way more. He only won one race, but the guy was spectacular. He was an amazing yeah. driver. And why can't you bring in someone like that in their 40s, 50s, 60s to kind of advise this team and, and run it properly as um. a team? It's a team. Yeah, do you remember? I don't know if you remember this because we're going to, we're going back to like the '90s. But yeah. Alan Prost had his own F1 team. Like, do yeah, you, it almost bankrupted uh, him, I think. Right? Yeah, it was like Prost F1 team or something like that. I think it was called. I don't know if you remember that. But I do. Like, I do. He ran that thing for, ooh, I want to say five seasons. I want, mm -hmm. I want to say. I think they. I think they were at the end of it in 2001. I think they were called like Prost Acer or something like that. Okay. But anyways, regardless, um, he already has that experience, right? Like he he already knew what was what was going what it was going to take to run an F1 team properly because he had already run one, even though it didn't go the way people wanted it to or he wanted it to. He still has that experience. Yep. Right, still learn from your mistakes and all those things, et cetera. And John Lacey actually raced for that team. Now that I recall, oh, I did? think Yarner truly did as well. Okay. Um, anyways, that being said, it's kind of like you already kind of had like one of the guys, yeah, like who you who you need, and then you had Otmar. Okay, yep. like that's a guy who's been like in it 
Like he has been in Formula One, steeped in Formula One for like a like a lot of his life. Like he knows. Like if he's telling you something, then you should probably listen to him. If he's telling you it's going to take five years or it's going to take seven years for you guys to get back on track, this is the money you're going to need to spend. And this is what we're going to need to do. We need to put these two factories together. We can't keep doing this apart, blah, blah, blah. And you're not listening to him, then, you know, the, I think the, the writing was probably already on the wall then, right? I I agree. And, and and uh, you know, Flavio's Flavio's a deal maker, right? The guy is, it, it, you know, good or bad, the guy's brilliant when it comes to bringing people together, making things happen. Yeah. And he has made a lot happen at this yes. program. And I'm, I am, I, I am, Cautiously optimistic for their driver lineup la- next year, Porsche and and, yeah. and Gasly, Jack uh, Doohan. Sorry, Doohan, not Doohan. Why, why did I say Porsche? I don't know why I said that. Jack Doohan, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I think because of McLaren Indy. I don't. And it doesn't matter. Um, uh, uh, Jack Doohan, uh, Pierre Gasly. Pierre Gasly's Gasly. had some bright spots. Auckland's yes. had some bright. There have been races where they've been not in it, but like uh, they're, they're in the points. There are reasons to be excited about the team. I just look at this and go, um, how long does uh, and how much does Alpine need um, worldwide branding? Do mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like the, the reason that it made sense to move to Alpine is because it was the upper echelon brand, like, you know, what a- Acura is supposed to be for Honda and that sort of thing. Um and I or Audi to Volkswagen, uh, and I just look at it, and, and I'm looking at the the cost of this, and and does Renault look at this team the way Red Bull looks at their team as a badging exercise, and do they need it, and does it benefit them as much? Yeah. Is the is the return on investment there yeah. right outside yeah. of not having a power unit? Yeah. When we take a look at the team uh, itself, it's got good bones, right? Like they have good trackside engineers they have a very strong team uh at their factories who are very passionate about the team i think what they need to do moving forward is they're shutting down that factory then either the money they're spending there that needs to go towards the car or it needs to go towards the marketing of the team and of the alpine brand around formula one when they're at formula one races grand prix doing more activations on the ground with Mm -hmm. their product if that's what they're looking at doing then i think that needs to be the direction that they need to take this thing now because i mean look i think oliver oaks is a very good talent he knows racing former driver as well very good one uh, by the way he knows what he needs to do he's run high tech and formula two formula three he understands the business, needs to learn, obviously, in Formula One because it's a bit of a different beast. But I think he's a safe pair of hands. And I think you have a good, stable foundation track side. I think you have a good crew there. I like the drivers that they're bringing in as well. I mean, Gasly's a, a known commodity. He can get the job done. I'm excited to see what Jack Doohan can do. So there are some really positive things for this team, Adam, that I am actually really looking forward to to see and i would actually hate to see a piece of renault actually just leave formula one look i get it the power unit side of things is a totally different thing and it's kind of sad that we're losing that piece of renault from formula one because you know one of my favorite cars and i always talk about it on here is the alonzo 2005 2006 championship winning uh renault like i love that car it the blue and yellow i mean it's it's one of my favorite formula one cars of all time so I like the fact that they're still kind of going to be hanging around and they're going to have a team and they're going to be able to build their own parts and they're going to be able to build their own car. I just think they need to execute now. And I think you need to take the money, whatever, whatever it was costing you to build power units. And if you're not going to do that, then that money needs to go towards the team and everybody at the team. And then also getting that activation on the grounds at F1 races. Um, switching gears a little bit here uh, to another team that, well, it's not even a team yet, but it's a team that that everybody's curious about is Andretti Global. Um, Mario Andretti is stepping back from the ownership of mm-hmm. that. Tim, yeah. can you explain what's going on there? Yeah, I put some news out on uh, my Twitter about that not too long ago. Um, and it sounds like 
Uh, well, it, I mean, Michael's stepping down at Andretti Global. Um, and, and who's going to come up and run it all? It's, you know, it remains to be seen as to who's going to be doing that. Okay. Um, it kind of sounded like, uh, from what I was told, like Michael just wanted to take a break. Like he, he had done enough. He'd had enough and he wanted to kind of take the foot off the foot off the, the throttle. The statement that I was, that I was given, it said that like Michael's goal essentially was to transition to more of a strategic role. So he would be focusing less on the operational side of the racing team. I should racing teams. Right. And he would remain, um, with with the team and would continue as like strategic advisor and and obviously a, an ambassador of his own team right like he would right. still be well, doing all this and i mean they're, they they just hired a bunch of people and built a factory or started up a factory yeah. in the uk for this yeah. formula one team they want like yeah. is, is that still going ahead i that's a great question we have no idea at this moment i, I don't even know what GM's thinking. I don't know if it's like GM would just do this thing on, on its own kind of kind of deal. They would just go at it and try and get into F1 on their own, maybe for 2028. I have no idea. Wow. That's just a guess, really. Um, I would say, like, you know, it's uh, – I think that the amount of money that they – not only were spending on the IndyCar project, which was, you know, quite a bit, man. They really invested a lot in their IndyCar project, Um and like Michael took that serious, yeah. And then also the the uh, the new factory that they're building, um, I believe it's a, you know somewhere outside of Indianapolis, and the amount of money that they're spending on that too. And I think they've had a lot of like he's spent. Well, I shouldn't say he. They have spent the Group One Thousand and One. So Dan Towers's uh, operation has spent a lot on this Andretti Global project, mm -hmm. and so I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Yet, I mean, there hasn't been much that's come out of this just yet. Um, I think Michael needs to discuss with everybody internally as to what they're doing, and then we'll probably learn more. He he will most likely, I would assume, hold a press conference at some point in the next couple months to kind of uh, give us a little more direction on what's happening, where things are going. Because at this moment, you know, a lot of the stuff out there is speculation, right? Like, yep. it's yeah, we just don't don't really know what exactly is going on behind the scenes there. But yeah, definitely curious, Adam. I, mean, I was pretty shocked when I, I saw that from uh, Sportico, I believe it was the uh, outlet that broke um, the, the news. Um, and then I kind of had to look into it to make sure that it was real uh, before, you know, I put anything out on Twitter. So talked to quite a few people behind the scenes before going to Andretti Global and just saying to them like, "Hey, like, what what actually is going on here?" and got that statement and put it out, kind of thing. But yeah, definitely a crazy story, right? Oh, it's crazy. I mean, it's yeah. really unexpected. But I mean, I do hope they're pushing forward for that eleven team. I really, you know, I think we need an eleven, and I think we need a twelve. Yeah, I mean, so. like, uh, obviously, it, let's wait and see what happens. Um, I mean, GM hasn't said anything, right? And they were pretty gung ho trying to get the formula one. So, you know, we'll see what, uh, what news they may put out in the next couple months and we'll, we'll just go from there. I mean, it's so hard to, I mean, it's easy for us to sit here and speculate, right? Right. Adam, like mm -hmm. it's, it just is, but until we actually know for a fact what's going on, we can talk about it more, obviously. Exactly. Um, I want to move on to, to Daniel Ricardo here just very quickly because there have been a few developments there, but nothing crazy. First off, um, Daniel, uh, when he was at McLaren and things weren't going well, used to write F E A, which stood for fuck them all. Uh, and, and, you know, because he was trying to drown out the critics and that sort of thing this year, uh, Will Buxton had tweeted about this and a few other people had too. not without a fight was what, oh, he put yeah, that's what we put his helmet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it seems as though, and Christian Horner confirmed this, that, that helmet Marco has been pushing for Daniel to be out of this team. Basically, since day one. I mean, we knew that, Adam. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, we knew that because he tells everybody. Right. Uh, and uh, and anyway, long story short, with with uh, Christian said that uh, he wanted him out by Barcelona, where Daniel mm -hmm. actually had a pretty good weekend, um, mm -hmm. all things considered. And what was interesting was Christian's like, listen, it's Formula One. You never know if Liam Lawson doesn't do well. If Perez's thing falls out, you never know what could happen. Like if his if his but I think, Tim, 
this feels this feels like the end. Like I whether or not those guys work out or they don't, I don't know that I I feel like Daniel's probably like, let me do something else. I think well, first of all, to go back to, to Spain and Helmut Marco wanting Daniel out of the car yep. by then, which at that point, which was which was strange because Daniel was coming off like an inc- incredible race weekend in Canada. Yeah, it really was. And it did appear that he had turned a corner. I mean, I would say like even Miami, even though that was a up and down weekend for him, I would say that was the start of him sort of getting sort of back on track with the car and figuring things out for himself. Um, but yeah, that surprised me because I was like, whoa, like this guy's just, yo, he's coming off like a really good performance in Canada. Why would you just all of a sudden jettison him from the cockpit and uh, put someone in for Spain uh, when you've still got to see if this guy can keep this thing going? Like, yeah. it doesn't make any sense to me. So, uh, yeah, that part of it, Adam, is is um, pretty interesting. I, I know the folks at the U.S. Grand Prix um, – they want to see if Daniel can kind of come back for that weekend. I mean, he's big in uh, Austin, Texas. He's <laughs> he's a very popular guy down there. Whenever um, whenever I get to go down, he's always doing something like wild with the fans and stuff. So I think they want him to kind of come down and do that race. But I mean, that's pretty hard to ask of of a driver who you know got removed from their seat and then ask them to all of a sudden just come back to the sport and do uh, you know do the old song and dance kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, I don't, I I don't know if he's going to be there. I don't know if he'll agree to, to something. Um, I know Red Bull kind of want to keep him on more of as a brand ambassador. And, and, you know, like listening to that interview on, I think it was F1 nation. Christian just talking about it. He, he, it's a little cryptic, but it sounds like, yeah, well, you know, we'll still kind of try and keep Daniel around in case something you know, in case Sergio doesn't work out and in case Liam Lawson doesn't work out. So, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> but, but like, it's, I mean, if you're a driver out of it, it's kind of like, actually, I'll put it to you. What do you do at this moment? Like, you're an athlete. You just got I mean, bounced from the sport you love. I, I think that, what do you do? Um, I think you want to go to a place where you're wanted. And so, if you're going anywhere, you're going to the Red Bull senior team. Uh, you're putting in your contract at Helmut Marco. Uh, you don't need to have any interactions with him. <laughs> he can go run V Carp. Uh, and I don't think Daniel and Helmut have some bad relationship. I just no, think I he's. Think so. I, I as I said in the last show, I think that Helmut gets in the way um, of of driver confidence and performance sometimes. And that's not to take away from him as a coach behind the scenes at all. I think um, with Daniel, uh, if he, I think you give him the rest of the season off. Um, you know, you have to pay him anyway. And, uh, and then if, if Sergio falters and Liam Lawson's not good, then uh, yeah, maybe you revisit that in the, in the summer. But I would say, or sorry, in the winter, but what I would say if I were him is, uh, then you're guaranteeing the seat for the whole year. I'm not going to have conversations. I'm not going to have helmet Marco in the press saying whatever, like are, am I Max's teammate or am I not? Right. Mm-hmm. And that's where the business aspect comes in. You do have to put the personal feelings aside and you go, you know what? Fine. You want me back? Cool. Here are the con. You're going to pay me some money. Uh, you're not going to talk shit about me to the press. Uh, and I am going to be Max's rear gunner. And that's what I'm here to do. And I'm, and I can't wait to do that. And, and I'll bring my big smile and my big personality to every track. And guess what? You're going to get a bazillion sponsors too. But Sergio brings a bazillion sponsors. Yeah. So, you know, anyway, <laughs> that's, that's the. That's what Ma- I would say. Imagine like he, imagine he comes back. Like imagine, like I'm not wishing for anything at this moment but imagine the turn of events if like sergio doesn't work out neither is liam lawson that would be <laughs> ricardo insane. and ricardo has to come back. imagine that like yeah. i i highly doubt that's what will happen but like well and that's got to be like a worst case scenario for well, when i heard that's you know terrible. when i heard christian say that i was kind of just like wait what <laughs> like, yeah yeah <laughs> he never wants to shut a door, which I respect. Yes. Um, I, I get yes. that. Uh, but it's, I, I mean, at this point, it seems like it's um, a pretty a pretty far-fetched idea, even more far-fetched than last time. Yeah. Uh, the last couple of things I want to hit here with the last five minutes that we have, Tim, are Gabriel Bordaleto and uh, Franco Colapinto. Now, uh, Bordaleto, for people that don't know, is obviously a fantastic <laughs> F2 driver uh, for McLaren, and he is Fernando Alonso's protege. This guy is repped by Fernando. 
Uh, Fernando is singing his praises, and he should. Bordelato has been amazing in F2. Sauber has an opening spot, they say, even though we think it's still going to Valtteri mm-hmm. Botas, right? Yes, I still think so. I, that's what I think, too. But... Not only is Bortoletto's name in there, Franco Colapinto's name's in there, and he's making a strong case. And what Franco has over Gabriel Bortoletto is F1 experience, Tim. Mm -hmm. He's got experience in a car, proven it. Who would you give the edge to over those two guys? One guy is Fernando Alonso, 400 races. Another guy is... You know, Franco Colapinto actually getting points for the team this year. Well, that that's the thing, Adam. I mean, Colapinto is able to kind of like show what he can do in an F1 car right now. Yes. Like it's kind of like you're already showing your services. So yes. you can, you know, the team can kind of get a gauge for your, you know, F1 ability immediately because they're seeing it for, you know, a driver like Bortoletto. I mean, they can't. All they can see is the Formula 2 stuff right now. And if they put him in for some tests and some simulator work, I mean, they can see a little bit more, but. I mean, the only way you can see if anyone can truly do F1 is when they're doing F1. And at the moment, that's Franco Colapinto. Really does sound like James Valls and his team is are pushing pretty hard for him to get that seat over at Sauber. But I still feel it'll probably come down to like Valtteri Bottas getting that that uh, that position. But I mean, there still are other teams behind the scenes, Adam, who are pushing. Uh, to try and get their drivers uh, into that seat at Sauber, no question about it. Yeah, um, it's like this. We're just watching this musical chairs thing play out it's in fun. front of us at the moment, right? It's, it's just fun. like you know, do, 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 and who's gonna who's gonna get the chair, right? That's basically kind of like what it feels like, what it looks like at this moment. But um, yeah, I mean, if I'm a team principal, I, I, I am looking at Bottas or Colapinto only because Valtteri's still got the speed. Still has the experience, can still get it done when there's points to be had. And then Colapinto is this young, really exciting rookie who looks to have a, a a pretty wide berth in terms of how much knowledge they can learn, how fast they can get. Uh, it's tantalizing to see that kind of talent. But at the same time, it's kind of like, well, you have Audi coming in. You kind of need a steady hand on the ship at the moment. You have Mattia Bonotto, who's brand new, who's kind of just jettisoned in as well. And it's like you have all these moving parts behind the scenes that kind of need to be stabilized. And so I think that's why you go with with a trusted hand and a, a Valtteri Bottas, because that's a part of the business and part of the sport where you're not too concerned. right? You've got your two drivers who are going to get you through it. They're going to get you through the year. If there's points to be had, they're going to mm-hmm. take them. And then, you know, you're not worrying about rookies coming in, crashing, crash damage, spending more money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. just the way I would look at it if I'm a team principal of, a, of an F1 team. <laughs> but, right. I mean, look, I, if I can get uh, – if I can sign Franco Colapinto up to, you know, be my reserve driver and uh, the driver that's going to replace either Bottas or Hulkenberg, I mean – Sign me up because I'm taking him. <laughs> yeah. But I would look at Carlo Pinto and go, if that's my, if I'm him and that's my only option, I know that Carlos signs, unless Williams produces a car in 2026 that is otherworldly, he's going to be looking back to trying to get back to one of the big teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that James Vowles wants Williams to be one of the big teams, but mm-hmm. it will take time to get there. And yeah. so if, if I'm Carlo Pinto, I'm probably thinking, okay, you go veteran there. I'm not going to sign up for Sauber. I'll stay at Williams. Because I know there's going to be a seat available here in the next two years. So, you know, that that would be what I would do. Yeah. Bortoletto is going to be interesting. If there is anybody that struggles on the grid to start next year, there are going to be conversations yeah. about that guy almost instantly. 100%. Yeah, he's so good. It's crazy. 100%. I know Kimi Antonelli because he's so young, gets a lot of the thing, and he should. But that's uh, Bortoletto is not a guy that you should ignore no. at all. Yeah, that's that's very true, Adam. I mean, even in a difficult Formula 2 season right now where nobody really likes the car, nobody really understands the car, no. he's the one who's been able to make the car work. And like that's where you kind of have to look at that talent, where it's yes. like, hey, nobody else in this grid can really get this thing going consistently, but this guy. Yes. We got to take a look at him. So that's, I mean, again, talent that will make its way or find its way into, onto a Formula 1 grid at some point, I think, anyways. I agree with you. I agree with you. So, yeah. uh, hey, 
Tim, uh, we'll catch up again next week. We got um, we've got a little while to till you get on a plane to go to the United States Grand Man. Prix, but very excited for that because uh, that's three weeks away, but. It'll go fast. Yeah, uh, I just, I just uh, it's too much time off, man. But, I know. Like, I get it. I think it's good, though, from the standpoint that, like, look, the teams need a break. I mean, it's uh, the last six races are uh, very demanding, like the yeah. travel schedule. Like, I'm only doing two of them, three of them. I'm only doing, like, three of them, potentially four of them. And it's kind of like, it, even just for me, it's like, okay, oh, well, wow, ooh, I'm going to be gone this long. I'm going to be here, there, there, and I got to go over here. I got to arrange to go over here. And I'm like, oh, God. Like, and I'm like, you got to think these these people in Formula One, they've been they've been doing it all year. And it's kind of just like, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. It's a busy, busy schedule. So, uh, Tim, we'll catch up with you next week, sir. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it.